Ana. Okay. Should I just start then? Yes. Okay. Please. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. This is the uh, third lecture of the uh, 2021 International Solvay Chair in Chemistry. And I would like uh, today to talk about a system, first about reticular chemistry in general, but also a system of sequences in multivariable or multivariate metal organic frameworks. So my, my talk today is divided into two parts. The first part, is more or less the reticular chemistry, the basics and the principles, um, a little bit of history. I have not talked about MOFs uh, and MOF history. So I just wanna spend a few minutes on that. And then I want to delve into what is called multivariate reticular structures, how we generate them, how we study them, and then how do we use them uh, those are the two topics that I would like to discuss today. So just a reminder for everyone and anyone in the audience who did not attend my other lectures, uh, reticular chemistry, we define it as the chemistry of linking molecular building blocks by strong bonds to make crystalline extended structures. Today, I will talk a little bit about carbon capture and that's uh, an aspect that, um, it's important to have molecular building blocks linked by strong bonds and crystallinity plays a major role in identifying exactly where the atoms are and working with well-defined structures. These are the three important aspects of reticular chemistry, the molecular building blocks, the strong bonds to make durable materials and the crystallinity to allow you to characterize the material and to have homogeneous consistent uh, behavior for the for the material. The result of reticular chemistry has been metal organic frameworks, which I will discuss today in the uh, first lecture of the Salve uh, series. I discuss I presented covalent organic frameworks, and just last week I talked about molecular weaving. So today I want to focus on metal organic frameworks and tell you where this chemistry is going through uh, discussing multivariate. Moths. Before I go further, I would like to just say that what has really made MOFs what they are today are the strong bonds and what we call the secondary building unit approach or the cluster approach, which I will elaborate on shortly. So the way we got into what eventually became known as MOFs is through what everyone was doing when I started as an assistant professor, which was to link metal ions with neutral rather than charged, but neutral uh, organic linkers. This was one of the structures we made very early on. And in fact, I told the student that made this structure that I'm not interested in these kinds of structures because I knew from the history of these uh, compounds and which were known since 1959. I knew that their structures were very fragile and they wouldn't be useful um, in terms of their porosity. So in 1959, um, Saito and co-workers showed how copper one could be linked by these neutral linkers, a diponitrile. Uh, and these structures are were characterized by single crystal X-ray diffraction and shown to have the motif um, drawn here. Um, they are charged frameworks and in the pore you have nitrates. So they were not strange to chemists at the time. In 1986, here's another example of a nice compound, exactly the same network as this one and a dinitrile as well to make this extended structure. And then in 1989, Robson in Australia showed that a tetra cyano or a tetra nitrile could be used in exactly the same way as all the others that preceded this work. So um, in, in Robson's uh, paper, it's, you can see that the motif 
the crystal structure uh, underlying topology is a diamond topology, just like all the others. And it's made from copper one using exactly the same chemistry and made from the same kind of building units. So there was really nothing new here, fundamentally new, same structure, same topology, same metal ions, same type of linkers and same openness and anions filling the pores. So when the student reported to me uh, the structure that I showed you from my group, this one, I was basically not thrilled about it and uh, not interested in this kind of work. And the reason for that is that as we tried to exchange those anions that fill the pores, the frameworks collapsed. So they were not interesting. Uh, they were not designable because copper one, as you know, could be trigonal, it could be tetrahedral. So it's, it's hard to design those vertices. And they're not chemically stable because of the weak bond that metal ions make to neutral linkers such as pyridine or nitrile. And, uh, I, and they're not polymers, it's a misnomer. These are extended structures that extend across the crystal. They're not, fundamentally, they're not polymers in the sense of what we think polymers are, which is just large, uh, molecules or macromolecules. So um, I was not as interested. However, as I sat down and started writing that paper for the student uh, at the time, um, I realized that perhaps there is an opportunity to enter this field and addressing those challenges I just listed by simply using what an inorganic chemist would recognize as a strong bond. And that is by adding, by using a carboxylate, now you have a negative ion and that negative ion um, enhances the bonding interaction. So in fact, we consider a cobalt carboxylate bond to be a strong bond. It's almost as strong as a covalent or a bond, a carbon-carbon bond. So uh, at the time, um, People said, well, you couldn't crystallize these because they are made of strong bonds. You need something with weaker interactions and therefore more reversibility. Well, um, you only had to try, well, try hard. And then at the end, we were able to get crystallization. Um, so this is the first crystal structure of what we then termed as metal organic frameworks. And they're made from these carboxylates that are linked to cobalt in this case. This report was the first MOF from charged um, linkers linked by metal ions to make what we reported as a crystalline material. So this was really, I would say, the beginning of the MOF field because now potentially you have strong bonding interactions and therefore potentially you could make architecturally stable structures. So from my training, of course, as an inorganic chemist, a carboxylate is very good at aggregating metals. And so we uh, find the reaction conditions that would allow you to make this paddle wheel and therefore linked in this case, zinc, but also copper one, uh, excuse me, copper two could be linked by these carboxylates to give a chelating system and a cluster. This is the so-called paddle wheel cluster. And this clustering then allows you to uh, make a, an extended, in this case, a square grid. The development here and the important thing that we contributed at the time was the fact that you could use clusters like these aggregates of metals as building units um, to make MOFs. Uh, intuitively, uh, these clusters are rigid and therefore we thought um, and later showed that in fact, they make architecturally robust frameworks that when, when you evacuate the pores, they don't collapse. So these we call secondary building units or SBUs. It turns out <clears throat> this strong bond SBU approach was to be the method of choice for making 
the great majority of morphs, one could almost say all the useful morphs today are made from the strong bond SBU approach, which we have developed in the mid 1990s and showed in this particular report, we showed for the first time that these clusters uh, are useful at making architecture robust systems where uh, the structure I just showed you has DMF molecules filling the pores. Those DMF molecules could be removed and through measurement of the gas adsorption isotherm, um, nitrogen adsorption in this case, but also CO2, we showed that in fact, they show type one uh, behavior isotherm. And this is necessarily, this measurement has to be done uh, at 77 Kelvin to show that gases spontaneously can pass through the pores without having to deform it and without using high pressure. This is the gold standard for measuring porosity. You can't prove permanent porosity without measuring these isotherms that are shown here at 77 Kelvin or at the boiling point of the gas. So, so this was the very first proof of permanent porosity in moths, and it was very exciting. Except that the surface area was not so high. And so when you compare these to zeolites, they were not, they were sort of as good as some of the zeolites, but not as good as the best zeolites. Um, to me, this was exciting because it showed that in fact, all that literature that preceded this work with the metal nitriles and so on. Now there is a pathway to making MOFs that are architecture robust. And now we have available to us the ability to exploit the uh, porous structure. Now, um, some people refer to a paper in 97 that was published by Kiragawa. Uh, and in that, in that paper, he showed that you can pressurized metal organics, in this case is a coordination polymer, and show that you can take up gases. Now notice this is a different experiment than the one I just showed you. This experiment is done at room temperature and at very high pressure. Okay, this is not a gas adsorption isotherm. The, this, uh, any material, even a piece of cloth, when pressurized with gas will show gas uptake. So this does not prove permanent porosity. And this experiment cannot give you the pore volume or surface area because it's done under high pressure. So as I said, it's the gas adsorption isotherm at 77 Kelvin or at the boiling point of nitrogen that uh, is the experiment that proves permanent porosity. What I'm trying to say here is that we need to be careful to refer to the correct experiments when we are saying permanent porosity. You can't claim permanent porosity unless you have gas adsorption isotherm, like the one shown here, and not this one, okay? So interesting as, as this might be, this is the proof of porosity. This basically allowed us to compare MOFs to the more established materials like zeolites. And this is what the zeolite community was constantly asking for to, in terms of proving porosity of MOFs. So that SBU approach then uh, and the permanent porosity allowed us to have more confidence to go forward with building structures that have, that are made from metal oxide units linked by in this case, terephthalate to make extended structures. And this is a very well-known structure we call MA5. Um, this structure is very, is very famous because its surface area is extremely high. So unlike the, the MOF I just showed you, this surface area is around 2,900 meters square per gram. And you can see a very nice type one isotherm at the uptake and release of the gas is quite reversible, showing that in fact, it's architecture robust and 61% of, uh, of the crystals are open space. So this was really a, an exciting time because the surface area was so high. In fact, some people thought when we published this, there was a misprint 
but it turns out that it's uh, it's reproducible and and it was very exciting since it broke all previous records of porosity in fact it broke all records of porosity uh, that were held for a thousand years so it's uh, it's it was uh, clearly a a point that opened up the whole field of metal organics. Um, so once the power of the SPU approach and the strong bond approach not only gives you porous material, but also now because your frameworks are robust, um, one can uh, use the same reaction conditions that produce these SPUs, but with different linkers. So you could have a linker that is functionalized same length but a different functionality and therefore have MOFs with functionalized pores or MOFs that have progressively longer and longer links to make same structures, we call them isoreticular, same underlying net, but now with larger, with lar progressively larger pores. Okay, so the secondary building block approach and the strong bond approach, as I said, has been a favorite in the community and without it, there would be no, I would say no MOF field. Otherwise we would be ta still talking about metal bipyridines and metal nitriles, which I call sculptures and, and not really useful, necessarily useful materials that you can do something with. So, um, so now the community has, <clears throat> exploited this approach with using a multitude of metal clusters and metal ions from across the periodic table. And we can see the linkers, of course, anything you can imagine, whether it's natural like lactic acid or citric acid. We have made what is called edible moths from lactic acid with calcium. So really you can think of it as porous milk or citric acid and calcium, which is porous orange juice. So anyway, you can make these in edible form, but also you can make them from simple widely available linkers, or if you so choose, here we teamed up with Fraser Stoddard back in 2010 and made this 11 phenylene unit linker and showed that, I won't show this today, the moth for this one today, but, but we showed that this could be made into a moth with a pore size of 98 angstroms large enough to fit uh, a, a biological molecule like GFP into the pores. Also the um, quite sophisticated, let's say linkers of this kind could be used or this kind where the linker itself could have points at which metals could reside and chiral linkers um, uh, who would that produce an intermeritally pure bulk or extremely long linkers like these to make uh, to make MOFs, as well as linkers that could bind uh, in 12 different points of, of extension. So the purpose of this slide is to say that if you can imagine a structure or a linker, it could be made into, into a MOF. So the key as I said, is the SBU approach. And the reason is, is that now you no longer necessarily care about the metals because the metals are locked into position from a geometric point of view. You don't really care so much about whether the, what coordination geometry of the metal is. Now your geometry is really defined by the carboxylate carbon atoms, which we call the points of extension. So that pattern wheel that I showed you before is geometrically, we think of it as a square. Okay, so from this square, if I have the ability to use organics to control the angle between the squares, then I could make zero dimensional uh, molecules or mole discrete molecules, large clusters of this kind, polyhedra, or I could make one dimensional systems or two dimensional systems or three dimensional system, depending on the angle that the organic molecule provides between the, between the SPUs. So again, this was very exciting because now for the first time, you can choose geometric uh, molecules as geometric objects and use the organic to provide you with the correct metric information that could lead to 
uh, different molecules. So the terephthalate that I was talking about, benzene dicarboxylate, all of a sudden could um, be a more complex molecule that provides you with different angles. So you have a bending angle, that's theta. You have a twisting angle in and out of the screen that would be uh, our uh, psi and uh, or phi and then psi is the folding towards you or behind you, behind uh, the screen. So this was very exciting. And so we, to illustrate the power of this approach is that now you use the reaction conditions and give you the paddle wheel. And then you add in a linker, instead of terephthalate, you add in the linker that has a theta of 120 or the angle between the carboxylate 120. And the structure folds on itself instead of making a square grid, you make a truncated cube octahedron, which in a way, the first nano particle to be characterized by single crystal X-ray diffraction. It's the particle itself is porous. Um, and now you can also play with this angle at 70 degrees to get the ladder arrangement. Or when the carboxylase is at 180 degrees, you get the square grid. So it's not these carboxylates are on the same plane. So the squares are on the same plane. And if you don't want to um, make a 2D or a 1D, you put a bromo functionality here to keep these carboxylates at 90 degrees to each other. And if when you run this reaction, if you don't heat up the reaction, then these angles will be maintained. And in the end, put the squares at 90 degrees to each other, as you see here in this three-dimensional structure. So this tour through the linkage of uh, squares into 0D, 1D, 2D, and 3D shows you how one can use organic chemistry, simple modification of the linker to provide the angles necessary to put those SBUs at the, at the angles that you want to channel the reaction to the structure, uh, to the target structure. So this ha has become quite a sensation. Being able to imagine a structure and go to the lab and actually make it is extremely desirable for chemists. And so we developed uh, what I whimsically call the periodic table of reticular chemistry. All you need to do is identify a molecule and determine its geometry and then link it to other molecules. This could be a moth or a cough to make the various uh, structures. And, and in some cases you make more than one structure. And these are all have been, have been made. They, the underlying topology is, giving a three, is given a three letter um, designation. So, uh, so you can imagine that if I just look at one of these squares, you could spend an entire career developing the chemistry of just one of these structures because now not only do you have the structure and its porosity, but you also can uh, change the building units in terms of their composition, in terms of their size, and therefore change the chemistry of the pore and what the material could be programmed to do. So the, this table goes on and you'll see here more shapes as I go through the slides, more uh, with higher connectivities. And you can see that we have, and others have made uh, different structures that we have enumerated with Michael O'Keefe at ASU. Um, but you see here that there are some structures still for the emerging scholars, there's still some structures that could be uh, completely new structures that could be made that have not been made thus far. And uh, further, you can see even more complex structures and more available space for people to plug in, young uh, researchers to plug in and make those. And uh, the list of course goes on and on. So, um, <clears throat> So this is very exciting because it, it's really putting together what I call the grammar and taxonomy of reticular chemistry. Now, if we can determine the geometry of our molecules, we have the chemistry that will put them together into, into a structure. It's a question of uh, what are the angles that are required for a particular structure and going to the lab and actually making it. So 
So from that first report I showed you with the metal carboxylic crystal back in 1995 when I was at Arizona State University. Now the field in, uh, as of the time that we made this study 2020, there are over um, research groups in over hundred countries uh, working on MOFs and their applications. So, so the field has exploded because the chemistry works. And the chemistry allows you to use what chemists really enjoy doing, making bonds, functionalizing molecules, and using them for a specific purpose. So we wanted to dig deep to find out why MOF5 and MOFs in general have extremely high surface area. So we did this experiment where we took a crystal of MOF5, you can see here a crystal of MOF5 inside a capillary tube or X-ray diffraction, we cooled the crystal down to 30 Kelvin and, and the crystallinity or the monocrystallinity was maintained even though you're cooling it down to that very low temperature. And even though the structure is porous, which is really a testament of how stable architecturally such a structure is. And then we did a crystal structure and you can see here uh, when the structure is completely evacuated, this is at 90% ellipsoids. You see how the structure is very well behaved. We observe nothing filling the pores as you would expect. So this is the very first time up to that point that someone has been able to do a single crystal structure of a completely evacuated MOF or even a porous material with such a large pore size. So you see here, for example, at least for one of the SPUs, you see absolutely no uh, very well behaved uh, cluster with um, a localized uh, electron density. And as you dose the structure with, with gases such as argon or dinitrogen, you can see the first argon molecules where they reside. They reside onto this pocket that is uh, that the SBU makes. Well, the adsorptive sites of of gases are all over the place. So there are not just on, the, on those pockets, but also on the faces of the triangular faces of the octahedron of the SPU, but also on the edges of the octahedron, as well as the faces of the six membered rings and the edges. And so the fact that we observed argon and dinitrogen on the edges of the six membered rings gave us an idea that in fact, those adsorptive sites, when maximized, should be should even give us more uh, higher surface area than MOF5. And so, so then that's how we made MOF200, which is, ha, is replete with exposed edges of six-membered rings. And everything you're looking at in this MOF is, a, is an adsorptive site. So the surface area here is 6,400 meters per, per gram. That's, a, that's as, as large as a football field for each gram of material. And that's the space onto which gases can be incorporated. I discussed hydrogen in my second lecture, but clearly this is widely applicable to get methane, CO2, water, as I will discuss next week. Um, but also, um, if you want to design catalysts into these pores, uh, the fact that the structure is very open, it's a scaffolding and that the pores have no walls, allow you to diffuse substrates in and out with great facility. So that's why you can see a lot of work on hydrogen, Um, and and depending on what they burn, let's say if, they, if the power plants burn coal or petroleum, you can get up to 16% of the flue gas is carbon dioxide. So you've got these two challenges, but in both challenges, you need materials that have high capacity, 
You need materials that are water stable because they have to be in the Uh, there are chemisorbents which are um, uh, where the carbon dioxide is bound chemically, such as the hydroxides or carbonates or the amine liquids or, or grafted amines onto solids. But you can see here from the operational challenges that none of these materials are ideal. None of them. They all have problems whether it is hydrolysis, low cyclability, high regeneration temperature, amine loss, amine oxidation. But if you look very closely, and I, I don't have time to go through this uh, item by item, but if you look closely, the MOFs functionalized, covalently functionalized, may have a chance uh, to be the ideal material that people are looking, are looking for. We have some hydrolysis, and we think that we can overcome this high regeneration temperature through functionalization of the adsorptive sites of the, of, of, the, um, of the pores. But nevertheless, I think that we are still in search of that ideal material and are still in search of designing the, that composition. But in the meantime, we're making progress and we're learning what it takes to make a good CO2 capture. You see here that um, in a dry feed, okay, this is no water here, that these zips do very well. So here you're bringing in nitrogen at almost 85% uh, and CO2 at near 20 or so percent. And you end up with CO2 being bound into the pores and nothing coming out. Okay, and then when the pores are filled, the um, CO2 breaks through. So does this hold up when you add water? And the answer is yes. You can see here that even in wet stream, CO2 is held into the pores and breaking through at exactly the same breakthrough time as, uh, as you see for the dry. This is quite powerful. This means that you have a material that can pluck out CO2 from flue gas and um, and it's, it's uh, and exclude water so that water does not cause any complication. The problem with these hydrophobic zips is that the capacity for CO2 is not as high as we would like it to be. But nevertheless, the idea of selectively removing CO2 from flue gas is demonstrated using these materials. Now, another system that I think is quite powerful, especially for air capture, is this MOP 808 system where the, the cluster, the SPU, has linkers that grow a cluster, that grow the MOP, but then it has on its girdle, in this case, these are zirconium clusters, and its girdle, it has acetates. These acetates, excuse me, not acetates, formates, formates uh, that are sort of terminal and they could be replaced by amino acids. In this case, I will show results from glycine, but you can do many different amino acids and look at how the behavior of CO2, corresponding behavior of CO2. This is what the cluster, what the structure looks like with, with the amino, uh, the glycines filling up the pores. You can see it's replete with NH2 uh, units. Um, and here, this is the, this is the power of, of the moth. 
that moth, when you, we have a kilogram prototype that deploys this moth and we expose it to air and you can see four PPM of CO2 reduced to 20 PPM. Okay, so that's pretty powerful demonstration of how you can create a material that can take up CO2 from air because the CO2 is bound to the glycemic units. Same thing for flue gas. You take flue gas that has 15% CO2 and you can reduce it down to 2% CO2. So regeneration temperature slightly lower than what I showed in that, in that table. But still, what we're trying to do here is to have a material that um, it's you, where you're able to capture CO2 and prevent it from reaching the atmosphere or taking it out of the atmosphere. So, okay. So the fact that you have MOPs that could be modified post-synthetically means that you have to reckon with what I call multivariate structures. Let me explain what that means. If I carry out a reaction in molecular chemistry, A plus B, and, and you have a product, a desired product C, and an undesired product D byproduct, you can isolate these two things typically. You can use chromatography, 